Good morning, everybody. Happy Sunday and welcome. Uh, we're thankful for each one that's here and for your taking the time to listen to this lesson. Uh, I want to say thank you to Steve for leading those songs. Uh, thank you to Alan for our scripture reading. Today's lesson is entitled, What Visitors Have a Right to Expect. Uh, let me tell you first where the idea came from. The idea for this lesson uh, was in an internet article by Mike Riley. Uh, I came across this and saved it in one of my folders. Uh, I've got a lot of little nuggets there that sometimes will be spread out into a whole sermon. Sometimes it's just a sentence or two, and I think that's going to make something good one day. Well, I'll open up that file, I'll grab something. So this is where this comes from. Uh, now, Mike Riley, he presented this to the congregation before a big gospel meeting. Uh, and the idea was to prepare them for a lot of potential new faces that would be there. Uh, and it's hard to know whether we'll have many or few on any given Sunday, uh, but perhaps leading up to Christmas, and Christmas being on a Sunday, uh, that we might benefit from this study. Uh, and really, I think the points contained here are good for any time at all. Uh, you know, just as much as it is about visitors, it, it's about worship. Uh, it's about the attitude, the assembly, the atmosphere uh, that is here when we gather together on the Lord's Day. And of course, we're always glad when we have visitors with us that they show a spiritual interest, and that it gives us a chance to be servants, uh, to show forward God's love to those who are gathered with us. Uh, so what do visitors have a right to expect? Uh, and when we're asking this question, what we're really getting to is, what impression would we want someone to come away with, or what reaction uh, that they have would tell us that we did well, uh, that we worship God in spirit and in truth? Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 gives us a good idea uh, of what a positive reaction would be, something to shoot for. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 25, it says, And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Uh, now this describes the outsider who comes into uh, the worship assembly of the church. Uh, and upon seeing that, you see that he is able to worship uh, that's first what is important. He will worship God. Uh, but what is his report? The impression, uh, God is truly among you. Uh, to see that these are godly people. And that what's being practiced here uh, has every intent and, and true sincerity uh, to worship God in spirit and in truth. Uh, you know, the same chapter describes what might be a, a not-so-great reaction. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 23 uh, therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Uh, and so two radical differences there. God is truly among you or you're out of your mind. Uh, and so much of that is determined by us uh, on how we choose to react. And it's a good reminder for us that Christians uh, wearing the name of Christ represent Christ. Uh, and so often people will shape their opinion of Christ and of the church uh, based on you, based on me, uh, what we decide to do. Uh, so our goal is to obey God and to help others do the same. Uh, that always must come first. We never want to be a hindrance to the gospel in any way, uh, and by our behavior, we don't want to distract from Jesus. Uh, the focus must be on Him, uh, not on us or on any other uh, source. It must be the Lord. Uh, so what do visitors have a right to expect? The first one is an obvious one, a warm welcome. Uh, we have to start with this point. It speaks to hospitality. It speaks to the love of God. Visitors have a right to expect a warm welcome. If you can't get that when gathered with God's people, where can you? Uh, it simply has to be the case. Uh, psalm 95, uh, you'll notice from our scripture reading, the way this psalm begins is actually an invitation to come and be a part of a worship assembly. Uh, the words of verse 1, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation, calling on others to join in. Uh, verse 2, let us come before His presence with thanksgiving, let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. You notice us again, the inclusive factor. And verse 3, uh, the reasoning behind it. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. This invitation and the inclusive, come, us, it's not about who we are. It's about who God is. Uh, because the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods, that's why we have this call to worship. And the joy that is here, to come with thanksgiving, to shout joyfully, it is an honor and a privilege, and we are glad uh, to be able to come together. Uh, now, as we make this point, we need to say, uh, the open call is for everybody. Uh, it's not come a select few if you're good enough and others stay away. 
regardless of person or background, the call is for everyone. Uh, James chapter 2 speaks about the idea of playing favorites or being partial. Uh, James 2, beginning in verse 2, it says, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, you say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or you sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Let us reshape our thinking this way. Uh, We are happy, we are thrilled uh, for everyone who will worship the name of God. Uh, No matter their age, no matter their race, no matter their gender. Uh, And it's almost like marriage vows, richer or poorer, sickness or in health. There's consistency there. Uh, Regardless of your situation or what you're bringing, you're coming to God and so I am thrilled for that. Uh, It's a sad thing when assemblies of the Lord's church give preference. Uh, Someone comes in who looks like they may not be very well off, and they say, well, why do we need another one of these? But someone comes in who looks a little bit rich in a nice car, and they all crowd up and say, oh, we need to get this one. That's not the idea at all. Everyone who will praise the name of God, that's exactly what we want. Uh, In Romans chapter 10, verse 11 and 12, it gives us a little more backing on this idea. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. You see, when we look to worship and this warm welcome for every single individual who will come and praise the name of God, it's really not about trying to find those who are good enough for worship. Because the truth underneath it all, not a one of us is. Not one of us is good enough to come before God, but by His grace, by His love and mercy, this open call has come for everyone. Uh, And so if we're looking for people to measure up, it's a failed system. Not one of us does. Uh, But God has made this promise in Scripture. Whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. He makes no distinction. Whoever the individual is, uh, you call upon Him. Uh, You believe in God. You praise His name. You obey His teaching. And that's why the warm welcome is extended to all. Because the welcome doesn't originate with us. We are simply echoing the welcome that our God has given to us and to all mankind. And so visitors have a right to expect a warm welcome. Uh, Number two, what do visitors have a right to expect? Exhortation and encouragement. Uh, Visitors have a right to expect exhortation and encouragement. And really these have to fit together because they are the one-two punch of biblical teaching. Uh, First, the exhortation side of it, as seen in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. Uh, The word exhort meaning to call near, uh, to call to one side, uh, to speak to. Uh, And we do this to speak the necessary things. You notice in this verse it describes a warning for the unruly. Uh, Exhortation by some can be seen as a negative thing. Uh, But all we're doing is sticking on the side of truth, uh, saying what must be said. The goal is not to shame anyone, uh, but simply to repeat what our God has said, uh, to proclaim the teaching of Scripture. Uh, Now, for those of us who go wrong, uh, that's a challenge. That's a hard thing to hear that we're not right with God. But we want to hear that because we need to make correction. Uh, We need to know God's Word so that we can obey it. Uh, But the other side here, and that fits so well with exhortation, is encouragement. It's not just saying, here's the warning. Here's where you may be off. The encouragement says, we can do this together because of our God. In Acts 11 and verse 23, uh, we get to see Barnabas really champion this cause. And you remember Barnabas, he's the the son of encouragement. Uh, This is really who he is. And as he was sent by the church in Jerusalem to Antioch, it says in Acts 11, 23, when he had came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. This is what what is meant to be present in a worship assembly of the Lord's church. We're going to stick to the truth, which means warnings are given against ungodly, sinful behavior. But with that is love, encouragement, purpose of heart to say, let us continue with God. Let us serve Him. Let us do all that we can to help each other in this cause. Uh, To rally to the side of good is the idea present here. Uh, In Acts chapter 20, in verse 32, you see Paul do the same thing that Barnabas did. 
Uh, now in Acts 20, he's meeting with the elders of the church in Ephesus. Uh, he has met them at Miletus, and in Acts 20 and 32, he says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Uh, this is the reason that exhortation and encouragement have to go together. Uh, where does he describe this strength coming from? What is able to build them up? It's the Word of God. Uh, the exhortation that is received in the instruction and the commands of God, as we open that up together, we are encouraged by it. Uh, to be built up, literally to be uh, upshored, to be strengthened, fortified for this service. Equipped for the task. Uh, in Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13, it describes how we work together in this regard. Uh, Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, it is part of God's design that we would exhort and encourage one another. It is part of His plan and really a requirement for the church uh, that we would help each other in this way. Uh, you notice the warning that's there, exhortation, beware, in verse 12. Uh, the exhortation in verse 13 to encourage one another daily uh, lest we be deceived by sin. Uh, we always work together in this regard. Number three, what do visitors have a right to expect? Uh, visitors have a right to expect involvement by members. Uh, now picture for just a minute that you're visiting with a congregation, you're in a new area, you've never been there before, you come into the worship assembly and you look around the pews and people are just in a daze. You need to see involvement. And you would expect to when you're gathering with the Lord's church, those who are calling on the name of God. The words of Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of God, uh, the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Uh, we need to realize that those who are involved in worship are not just those who come up here to the front of the auditorium. Uh, those who are involved in worship is everybody. Uh, everybody here in this room. And part of what we see here, the singing, uh, the song service as part of worship, to teach and admonish in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. To be involved, to be actively engaged in worship. And really this relates to every part. This verse talks about singing, uh, but every aspect of worship is something that we are all meant to be participating in together. Uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 16 describes the church united in Christ uh, the life that is there. It says, From the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Uh, and you can see here how important this is, because if every joint is not supplying its part, uh, if every piece is not doing its share, uh, then the sum total loses out. Uh, the advantage that could have been there, the potential, is wasted uh, when we neglect the opportunity we have to be involved, to participate, to help others in worship. You notice the end result to cause growth of the body, uh, for the church to be healthy, to be functioning as we should. Uh, we must participate. Uh, now, let me show you a picture and share something with you. Uh, G.E. Watkins wrote about people who are bored in worship. Uh, now again, the goal is, is not to shame anyone. I've fallen asleep in worship with the best of them. Uh, the goal is for all of us to re-aim our focus uh, and to realize that this is not about what we can get out of worship, but about the true goal, praising the name of God. Uh, so listen to what Brother Watkins wrote. Sometimes we hear the complaint about the boring worship service, and some feel excused from attendance because church is too boring. The songs are too slow, prayers are too long, or the preacher talks in a monotone voice. Sometimes these are factors that can be fixed. This, however, gives the idea that the worship service is for those in the pew. Uh, while there are benefits of worship to those who go and attend, we need to understand that worship is for the Lord. Uh, and a better thought might be, is the Lord bored with us? Uh, is the Lord bored uh, with our worship? Uh, you know, those who aren't engaged, those who aren't involved, those who aren't participating... Uh, we are coming before the throne of God to praise His name. What must He think of what we're bringing? Uh, I had a teacher in school who said there are a lot of Christians who are just going to hate life in heaven. Uh, and you look at all the scriptures that describe life in heaven, what are they doing? Worshiping. 
If you can't handle a worship service, you're going to be miserable in a home in heaven. We spend that time praising God. Uh, you know, to sing these songs, not to hear the beauty of, of our voice, but to hear the beauty of this message. Uh, to be engaged, respectful in prayer, not for the man who's leading it, but for the one who's being addressed, Almighty God. Uh, to pay attention to the lesson, not because of who the speaker is, but because of this source, that this is the Word of God. Uh, I love to see people engaged and taking notes because that's the same way that I take in a lesson. And then later to go back and to look at what was said there to dig in deeper in those ideas. Uh, of course, the Lord's Supper to be done in remembrance of Christ and His sacrifice. All of these designed by God to focus us, to help us come before Him in the proper attitude. And our God who is so loving, so kind and so patient, He set this up for a reason. Uh, so we wouldn't fall into the same trap that humanity always falls into. Uh, in Matthew 15, Jesus describes it as he's battling with the Pharisees. Uh, Matthew 15, 7 and 8, he says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Uh, never let this be said of us, uh, that we come to worship simply to offer lip service. Uh, simply to go through the motions and to not have our heart engaged. Uh, what a terrible crime to come before our Creator this way. Uh, God who sent His Son to die for us. Jesus, that sacrifice for our sin. Uh, and we can't even properly praise Him. Uh, we can't even properly come before Him uh, with the respect that worship is due. Uh, so visitors have a right to expect involvement by members uh, to see that and to be engaged themselves. Uh, number four, what do visitors have a right to expect? Uh, love for truth. Uh, and this relates to some of what we've seen. There is overlap here, uh, but it deserves a point on its own. Uh, when you are gathering with the Lord's church, it needs to be overwhelmingly evident that God's word is cherished here because God is cherished. Uh, because of the respect that we show Him, uh, of course, His word carries powerful weight. Uh, and this is always the teaching of Scripture. Psalm 119, 159 says, Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. Uh, the use of those terms, to revive me, uh, to bring me back, to refresh me, to give me life, all of that is rooted in hearing the precepts, the commands, the teaching, the Word of God. Uh, Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have those who love your, your law. Nothing causes them to stumble. Uh, stability because of love for truth, because of respect for Scripture. Uh, Matthew 5 and verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, and that is always meant to be the attitude present in the church, to hunger and thirst for righteousness for the things that are of God. Uh, and as we seek Him, we will never be dissatisfied. Uh, one of the songs in our songbook, and we, we sang it today, and I thank Steve for doing that, I love to tell the story. Uh, written by Arabella Catherine Hankey, uh, who passed away in 1911. Uh, she was the daughter of a wealthy English banker, uh, but she didn't prize money. Uh, she wasn't caught up in materialism. As a teenager, she taught a girl's Sunday school class. Uh, and later, she traveled to South Africa, where she served as a nurse. Uh, and it was while she was recovering uh, from a lengthy illness at the age of 30, she wrote a poem all about the life of Christ. Uh, the poem had two sections. The first was entitled, The Story Wanted, and the second was entitled, The Story Told. Uh, this is where the words for the song, I Love to Tell the Story, comes from. Uh, and I'm going to focus in on what's said in the last verse of that song. Uh, I love to tell the story, for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. Uh, now, if we're engaged in worship like we should be when we sing this song, you think about the words that are there and, and the meaning behind that. Is it true of us? Uh, and would visitors see that love for truth? Uh, that even those who have been in the worship assembly day in and day out, for years, for decades, they're still hungering and thirsting to hear about Jesus, to hear the gospel. Uh, and it, it's not old to them. They're not tired of it. They're not sick of it. They say, I need that message. Over and over again, tell me more about Jesus. To love to tell the story and to share it, to pay it forward. Uh, and it's a good reminder for us that the aim here uh, is not to love truth so that we can memorize a lot of it and brag about our Bible knowledge. No, there's humility here. Because we're the servant and God is the master, we have to hear this message. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, uh, you see the scripture there. It says, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, 
that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, Now the Apostle Paul here writing, he says, I am least of all saints. But what does he hold to? What does he prize and treasure here that he would preach the gospel? Uh, To present it among Gentiles. And how does he describe truth, the gospel message, the doctrine of Christ? He describes it as unsearchable riches. Uh, To say you can't find the amount. You can't find the sum total. That's how valuable it is. A love for truth. And that certainly should be present in the Lord's church. Now the last point that we'll make this morning, uh, what do visitors have a right to expect? Love for one another. Uh, When someone comes into our worship assembly, it needs to be very apparent. These are people who love each other. Uh, And it's not because of how great we are. uh, It's because of how great our God is. uh, That we are able to see the love and forgiveness God gives and to channel that forward to other people. Uh, And it's a problem when you come into a worship assembly, a church family, uh, and you see factions and feuds and people who are talking behind each other's back and they're at odds with different things. Uh, If God's people can't be united by love, no one can. Uh, Love for one another must be present in the church. Uh, In 1 Peter 1 and verse 22, it says, Since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Uh, This is the goal, this is the aim, and and this is the picture that ought to be God's church. To love one another fervently with a pure heart. Uh, And this is not a suggestion or something to get to in your extra spare time. It's a key part. Uh, In fact, in John 13 and verse 35, uh, it says, A new commandment uh, I give to you, 34 and 35, uh, that you would love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, and by this all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love one for another. Uh, So a commandment, a proof sign to see these are the disciples of God, these are the ones who are fulfilling His will, because there's love there. Uh, Love that is always ready to be shared, always ready to be exhibited. Uh, In Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13, uh, describing what the Christian ought to do, it is to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Uh, What an amazing text on this idea to see the teaching of God. And it's almost as as if someone came with a complaint uh, and said, well, here's the reason that I can't love so-and-so. And And he says very plainly, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. Uh, There was no reason for Jesus to forgive us. And so we also must freely extend that forgiveness, that love, uh, the unity uh, that is meant to be present in the church demands it. Uh, in 1 John chapter 3, uh, and this will be the last on this point, 1 John 3, 18 and 19, uh, it says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. Uh, this is a great verse because it's one of those definition verses. Uh, you say, well, how do I assure myself before God? Or ask, how do I know that I'm of the truth? Uh, well, the scripture here tells you uh, to love. Uh, Not just in word, not just in tongue, uh, but to love in deed, to love in truth, to show that action. Uh, You know, you can say that you love someone a thousand times, but it's not until you really show it that it's evident, that it is put forward in a strong and powerful way, that it becomes real, uh, that it is tested, and that it stands assured. Uh, So that's the, the description that's given there. Love for one another must be present in the church. Uh, And so we've examined a a few biblical points on the worship service, on what visitors have a right to expect. And this is something that we're all working on together. Uh, It's not that we have these things mastered, but we need to realize the attitude and atmosphere that needs to be present in worship. And together, every one of us can can push towards that. Uh, You know, perhaps there are some uh, who have ears dull of hearing or who have hard hearts. And if they visited, they wouldn't be impressed by anything. Uh, But you know, there are many others Uh, who when they see us form an opinion of Christ and of His church, and if we're behaving as we should, uh, they can see good and noble hearts, they can say God is truly among you, and they can worship God properly. Uh, But they have a right to expect a warm welcome, to expect exhortation, encouragement, involvement by all the members, uh, a love for truth, and a love for one another. 
Uh, and we hope that when visitors are present, the gospel of Christ has, has free course and that we do nothing to inhibit uh, or to get in the way of salvation. Uh, to never distract from, from Christ and to do nothing to hinder uh, another person's obedience to Almighty God. Uh, if you're not yet a Christian this morning, the opportunity is available to you to have your sins washed in the waters of baptism in the blood of Christ, to rise as a new creature who's ready to serve Him. And if you're already a Christian who's fallen back into a lifestyle of sin, uh, you know what God is like. Uh, he is patient. He is loving, forgiving. Uh, he's ready to forgive you, and we're ready to work alongside you. Uh, if there's anything that we can do to assist you this morning, please come as together we stand and sing.